Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed your coffee. I have to begin by expressing my deep embarrassment and surprise at having been awarded the Neuenschwande Award um, when I got the message from Theo, obviously the first thing that came into my mind is the Virgilian expression, Timeo Danao set dona ferentes. I fear the Greeks even when they bring gifts. And my response was that of the prophet Laocon that Virgil describes, who points out to his fellow Trojans that these gifts might have a rather unpleasant consequence. But we all know what happened to Laocon and his two sons. They were, if you don't quite remember, destroyed by sea serpents. It's the topic of Sam Robinson's next paper. In all seriousness, this is a huge honor for me. And uh, I hope that what I'm gonna talk about in the next few minutes will do justice to the recognition that I've received. Um, as you see on the first slide, my epigraph is taken from Georg Christoph Lichtenberg. This very famous remark, one might say that the desires, at least the secret desires of all enlightened Europeans are deflected to the West like our magnetic needle. What Lichtenberg was in fact getting at in this apothem is the effect of the American Revolution on the European Enlightenment, but I'm using it here to remind us, and it seems appropriate for an organization that calls itself the European Society for the History of Science with its members' extraordinarily powerful record of mobilizing work on what some call the European periphery to remember precisely that in many ways, certainly not always, but in many ways, the category of the European, the category of Europe is a dialectical one. It's defined in opposition. One of the key sites, the sites that I'll be talking about mainly this morning, are sites out with the European continent where folk of very, very different dispositions, cultures and practices began to identify themselves as Europeans. The two places that I'll be talking about mainly in the back half of the paper are um, Tasmania, Van Diemen's Land and the Valley of the Nile in Egypt, both around 1800. And there we see absolutely projects that precisely define Europe in an alien world, in a world the Europeans, as they call themselves, define as alien. But the principal theme of the talk is prompted by the... Um, okay, how do I move the slides? Do I press that? No. Do I press that? No. How do I move on? Anyone? This one? That one? This one? Cool. That's great. So in order to progress, you have to move to the left. <laughs> We've been invited to reflect together on the intertwined themes of science policy and the politics of science. We were reminded yesterday that those two words are the same, for example, in French. There is a range of instructive terms in English that show some of these connections between policy and politics in the case of the sciences. My conjecture here emerges from related senses of the key word measure. Measure, at least in English, is both a political policy and a scientific quantity. Practices of taking measures have long helped orient the historical geography of the sciences and of knowledge more widely, as this extract from the very beginning of Brecht's great play, Mother Courage, reminds us. 
It is the recruiting officer tells us at the start of Mother Courage, only in times of war that folk are measured. In the examples considered in this paper, precision measures have been used as a sign of politically consequential difference, as though inaccuracy and approximation, mendacity and laxity were somehow the property of others, aliens, subalterns, elsewhere. But these measures have also simultaneously been a way of making that difference stick when these foreign others have been subjected to apparently precise scrutiny and surveillance, and the numbers generated in the encounter held to reveal the contrast. So what might seem a distinctive symptom, we measure they don't, is also a discriminatory tool. We know they don't because we measure them. The relation between these two senses, it can be suggested, well, I can be suggested, I'm going to suggest, has had important consequences for the ways in which the histories of the sciences, especially the ways of the history of sciences that we practice, have been and should be told. In some of my previous work, I tried to make sense of a few of the uses of precision practices and hardware in mobile encounters between different cultures in cases such as the gold trade in West Africa, chronometric navigation in the South Pacific, antiquarian inquiries in Egypt, or survey astronomy in South Asia. Uncertain calibration and differing metrologies played important roles I wanted to show in the orientations of surveyors, traders, servicemen, and administrators. The knowledge produced by precision instruments hinged on these fragile forms of social order, which were only transiently established in these relations and were easily disoriented. The point that emerged from those cases was that others, precisely non-European, attitudes to measure, especially their behavior with respect to fundamental measures of capitalist commodity production and exchange, seem to reveal the natural characters, the innate qualities of cultural difference. So as in the top left image, Akan traders were judged peculiarly susceptible to forms of what the Portuguese and then the Dutch called fetishism. Pacific Islanders in the lower center were seen as manipulators and disruptors of property relations. Egyptian fellahin seemed strangely uninterested in measures of hydraulics or even growing cash crops. Hardware, therefore, was supposedly both rigorously situated, instruments work because we know where they are, yet strikingly independent of position. Instruments work because what they deliver can move. The very notion that the precision of Europeans' instruments somehow allowed them, somehow allowed them an unprecedented escape from and invulnerability to such material vagaries of social life has of course been an absolutely indispensable and always controversial theme in histories of the sciences. That's been true since at least the critical interventions of Immanuel Kant, in which questions precisely of compass direction and orientation were so significant. During the end of the 18th century, that Prussian geography professor who never traveled but avidly read Voyager's reports, evoked a version of knowledge making in the sciences that explored the complex relation between measure and the cosmopolitan or in principle universal solidarities of social community. As I noted in a lecture I gave eight years ago in Paris on the rituals of measurement, this markedly idealist notion of precision mentality as the principal feature of emergent modernity was of course decisively formulated 
in Alexandre Coiré's writings of the 1940s, composed in direct response to the puzzle of apparently pre-modern failures of technical innovation. Coiré was responding, as you see here, to the work of the uh, eminent classicist and philosopher Pierre Maxime Schul, his work Machinisme et Philosophie, uh, which first came out in 1938 and then in a second edition in 47, and the annal historian Lucien Fevre's Le Problème de l'Incroyance au XVIe siècle, which first came out in 1943. Authority on ancient philosophy, Schul had asked why, according to him anyway, no advanced technologies emerged in the classical epoch. He noted Greek leisured classes' contempt for artisans and merchants. Koire admired what he saw as Schul's, quote, psychosocial, unquote, account of this apparent blockage which Koire understood as, and I quote from Koire, a much more nuanced and in the same way, much more satisfactory explanation than that offered us by the Marxists, unquote. But since Koire assumed that any novel device, machine or technology flowed completely and entirely from advanced abstract scientific theory, Koire remained puzzled, I quote from him, why the inventors of episteme did not apply it to praxis, unquote. Koire was encouraged by Lucien Fevre's claim that modernity was divided from the pre-modern and from all other cultures by les outils mentales, by mental tools of calculation. And as you see in the quote on the screen, according to Coiré, and you'll know this quote very well, both past people and remote people, in other words, to put it bluntly, non-Europeans, did not know how to calculate point and were not accustomed to do so point. They did not have the means point. He reckoned precision was embodied in instruments, but that precision measures need precision mentality, a unique intellectual transition in early modern Europe from the approximate to the precise world. And Fevre, fascinatingly, agreed enthusiastically. According to Fevre, the great transition from approximation to precision, understood as a problem of mentality in its ultimate source was, Fevre told us, perhaps the capital fact of the modern history of our civilization. Many historians of science have sought to challenge or escape from, or more often simply ignore, these polarized and dichotomous histories. And if they bother with them, they trace in their contemporary political conditions the sources of their appeal. The best historiography and sociology of quantification and precision, best in this talk means I agree, by the way. That's all it means as well. The best historiography and sociology of quantification and precision in the sciences has understood their crucial dependence on shared forms of craft skill and approximate judgment, and thus the status of embodied artisan knowledges, their regulation and exploitation, especially in cases of mobility and encounter. And of course, the chronology has changed more than somewhat. So recent studies of quantification and precision have argued rather that it was the political conjuncture of late 18th century Europe and beyond that saw the institutionalization of precision practices within the sciences, that these processes decisively accompanied processes of labor relations and state formation. A salient case that will provide material for the balance of my talk is that of the military and civil engineers employed by the French state 
in institutions such as the Corps des Points et Chaussées and the Ecole de Génie, for whom the categories of efficiency and hierarchy played such crucial roles. From the 1790s, French regimes engaged in programs to forge connections between artisans, instruments, and the state, including staging some of Europe's first industrial expositions in 1798 and again in 1801, as well as rather ambitious projects in metrological reform and precision engineering. The example on the screen is instructive. From the 1760s, the engineer Charles Coulomb oversaw military laborers in the Caribbean slave plantations of Martinique and thence designed precision methods for estimating work rates in French workshops and farms. In the 1790s, Coulomb's arguments encouraged his fellow military engineer, Edmé Renier, to make an instrument that had to be portable and would be applied by, quote, the enlightened, unquote, to determine human bodies' comparative physical powers in different socio-industrial settings. It was called a dynamometer, a dynamometer. It involved compressing a metal rod, don't try this at home, it's a nightmare, of, that moves a needle on a numerical scale, the scale is on the right of the print, to estimate natural, manual and back strength. It's the back strength that's really, really annoying. Right? This bit, just done. And could be applied, as you see, both to humans and animals. <coughs> Similar dynamometric devices were designed accurately to judge the force of canals and water wheels and steam engines. Important here, was the so-called practice of architecture hydraulique, hydrological architecture, uh, that nourished these apostles of precision measures. The mid 18th century military engineer, Bernard de Bellidor, produced the founding text, almost as if he'd read Thomas Kuhn, in four volumes between 1737 and 53. Hydraulic measures were political measures explicitly entire populations were cleared from their lands their rights expropriated their labor practices overhauled gaspard de prony chief engineer at pont chaussee made himself the chief government specialist in this enterprise his Nouvelle Architecture Hydraulique of 1790 was the new text. He designed precision brake dynamometers to judge the efficiencies of newfangled steam engines and was followed by his junior colleague at Point Chaussee, Claude Louis Navier, who compiled a completely updated version of Bellidor to unite hydraulic architecture with the renovated science of work. And as is very familiar to you, I'm sure, in this text, Navier coins the phrase, a kind of mechanical currency, monnaie mécanique, to compare different kinds of machines, societies, and labor systems. And it was that model of mechanical currency that would be used to define quantifying Europeans and qualitative others. It seems to me that this is of more general historiographic interest for many reasons, partly because of the circumstance of the conjuncture in which these measures were deployed. On the one hand, we see the emergence of what we might call the classical laboratory scene, as in Madame Lavoisier, Marie-Antoine Poles' magnificent drawing of about 1790 of Lavoisier's experiment on the working human body, where the laboratory is functioning under what we could call a colonial regime of domination and measure. On the other hand, at exactly the same moment, we see the establishment of colonies which advertise themselves as laboratories, of which the British penal colony in Port Jackson, established in 1788, 
in New Holland, in New South Wales, in Australia. It has many names, but one nature um, is the supreme example. This is Francois Perrin and Claude Le Sueur's drawing when they visited in 1802. So we have a very interesting chiasmus that, in my view, it is worth reflecting on when we're thinking about the alien production of Europe and the role of measure in that production. Laboratories begin to look like colonies, colonies begin to look like laboratories. That politics, that chiasmus, has an extremely long and depressing history. No doubt historical reflection on the politics of measurement has oriented attention to precision survey as a privileged enterprise of modern militant states. It's how states see, it's how they govern, it's been argued, and it's what distinguishes them, it's been claimed, from other social forms. Critiques of high modernist surveillance and aggression in regions such as Egypt and Southeast Asia, I'm thinking here of the work of James Scott or Tim Mitchell, came to associate ideologies of precision with ferocious and often ineffective or indeed catastrophic European state action. A suggestive example, a notorious example, is provided as you see here by the writings of the sometime Nobel Peace Laureate and alleged war criminal, Henry Kissinger. In an article published at the start of 1963, reflecting on strains in the North Atlantic Alliance, in those days NATO suffered from strain, on Britain's proposed entry into the common market, in those days Britain was trying to get into the common market, and on the charismatic character of the troublesome European leaders Charles de Gaulle and Conrad Adenauer, the Harvard analyst Henry Kissinger contrasted the apparent views of these leaders that, I quote from Kissinger, reality is the structure of the world they wish to bring about, unquote, with what he saw as professional experts restricted realist epistemology, but respected, even if it occasionally manipulated Henry, facts. It would instead, he argued, be necessary for political policy, I quote from him, to encompass a more embracing concept of reality than that which is today fashionable. The West, he continues, requires nothing so much as men able to create their own reality, unquote. That claim, as you see here, was then developed with the intensification of the Vietnam War, which Kissinger first visited in 1965 during US military mobilization. He once again drew the stark contrast between two kinds of people, statesmen and prophets. Statesmen avoid experiments and engage in slow construction. Prophets create their own realities. And in this passage that he added in publication, he explained that the distinction emerges from within the history of science. The West, I'll read it out because it's memorable. The West deeply, is deeply committed to the notion that the real world is external to the observer, that knowledge consists of recording and classifying data, the more accurately, the better. Cultures which escaped the early impact of Newtonian thinking have retained the essentially pre-Newtonian view that the real world is almost completely internal to the observer, 
empirical reality has a different signification for these new countries than for the West, because in a certain sense, deep breath, they never went through the process of discovering it. So the Vietnam the United States was bombing was being bombed because it was pre-Newtonian. This, I'm trying to think of the adjective here, remarkable will do. Remarkable is a lovely English word. It means I really don't agree, but I can't bring myself to discuss any further. This remarkable 1966 statement has, of course, an extremely rich afterlife. It, I'm not the first and I will not be the last to exploit it for historiographic purposes. Sven Dupre, Geert Somsen have used it extremely cleverly in their work on the historiography of the sciences and their politics. It was used notably in Edward Said's Orientalism of uh, composed in the mid 1970s at Stanford Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at a critical conjuncture in US relations with the Middle East. Kissinger's comments on the pre-Newtonian imprecision of quote, many of the new countries occupied a significant place in Said's characterization of Orientalism's politics of knowledge Western power, Said told us, over the Orient is taken for granted as having the status of a scientific truth. And as you see here, Said juxtaposed Kissinger's dichotomies with statements by British colonial administrators in Egypt, like the ghastly, I can say this because he's dead, the ghastly Evelyn Baring, Lord Cromer, Governor General. Uh, for whom I won't read this out because it's uh, offensive, racist, false, and generally annoying. Um, but you can see, I hope, that for Cromer governing Egypt, he was governing a world, precisely a world characterized by lack of measure, by imprecision, by imprecision. While at the same time, as you see on the left, for Cromer and his allies, it was the introduction of number, it was precisely the introduction of number that represented the arrival in force of European values in all senses of the word values in Egypt through territorial reorganization as in Joseph Hekekian's scheme for model villages and indeed in Egyptology itself, as you see top left. The other, or so it seems to me, significant use for our field of Kissinger's statements is in the work, for example, of the great environmental historian, Alfred Crosby, who first of all, in a plenary lecture at the 1989 International Environmental History Conference, and then in a book that he described, it's a shame Costas is not here because of the taxi strike, um, I should say that Crosby described his book, The Measure of Reality, as, and I quote, a Sisyphean task, right? It was a Sisyphean task, according to Crosby, to write a global history of measurement and the sciences in 1997. The book offered a wide ranging account of what Crosby called the flying leap of faith. through which, quote, Westerners brought maths and measurement together. An alliance of merchants and scholars, the use of money, the practices of visualization, salvaged the mentality of Europeans who, according to Crosby, had until then used numbers for effect, not accuracy, and settled for imprecision. One telling point about Crosby's work, and he was surely not alone in the late 90s in this respect, was that he identified the European past with all cultures everywhere else. Unlike, he says, as you see here, the societies of the East, the West was hungry to learn 
by staring at standardized marks on paper. It wasn't just then that these measured Westerners separated themselves from their own past. It was also, and in many ways, even more importantly, they separated themselves from the Orient, from a fundamentally imprecise world elsewhere. So in the balance of the talk, I'm going to look at two cases, I hope briefly look at two cases, where measures are being, were being used both to define what counted as European culture and to define the difference between that culture and others. The first example is very familiar in science studies. The expedition launched in 1800 by the French government into the Southwest Pacific, to Timor, to Australia, to what was then called by the Europeans Van Diemen's Land, um, in order to survey, map, acquire, and in principle conquer these territories. Um, it's only by the skin of South Australians' teeth that they don't live in a French colony called Terre Napoleon, in which case they would be able to vote for Macron or not, rather than having to vote for Albano or not. That's what enlightenment means. That's what the mission civilisatrice boils down to. This has become the canonical late enlightenment example of the application of precision measure to distinction between moderns and others. By the late 1790s, colonial administration and knowledge of overseas territories was of course of immediate political concern in France. This was a conjuncture of global war when large French military forces and surveyors were dispatched to occupy Mamluk, Egypt in 1798 and uh, unsuccessfully, thank goodness, to subdue Toussaint Louverture's liberation movements in Saint-Domingue in Haiti from 1802 to 1803. As immediate brief for Baudin's expedition, as we know, in summer of 1799, the young administrator Joseph-Marie de Gerando set out an investigative program directed at others, at indigenous populations, that as you see here on the screen, hinged on the telling claim that the philosophical traveler who travels to the extremities of the earth, in fact, traverses the series of ages and travels into the past. In other words, for Desjardins and Baudin and his uh, savant, to go to travel was to travel in time. Far away is long ago. The protagonist on the voyage was the physician and corresponding member, François-Auguste Perron. In an initial memoir presented to Paris Medics on anthropology, Perron insisted that these peoples who are most distant from our civilization are even closer to nature. So a history of humanity must be established and what he called their physical perfection would be established with precision. And unsurprisingly, he took along with him the dynamometer. Measures of these people's strength, Perron decided, told decisively against that physical perfection. Who was he encountering? He was encountering the Tyridim people of what the Europeans called Mariah Island, part of the very large Oyster Bay tribe, the largest in Van Diemen's land. It's bands moving seasonally between the coast and the bush and the marshes further inland, though some remained near the sea. And it was those summer dwellers on the beach who had the exciting and 
uh, devastating experience of meeting Perron, who tried out the dynamometer on 12 of them. In a report composed at the time, he asserted that every Tiradim whom he met on the island, quote, provided the story of nature and all mankind, a faithful trustee for the fundamental rights of the human species, he preserves them intact in their basic completeness. These numbers were taken to show absolute differences among people from a small range of precision measures. Perron, as we know, compared them with Timorese, with Bedouin in Egypt, um, and he insisted that their lack of strength was the result of a failure of social organization in what he called the savage state. This was because they lacked property rights. Now, as we know, these numbers, let me move on, these numbers have played an absolutely critical role in science studies because of the work of Bruno Latour and others in that they show the Archimedean relation between measure and distinction. But as several historians have pointed out, it's disorienting to work out why those numbers carry that weight. At the time, Perrin's colleague Fresinet showed that he'd read his scales wrongly. Perrin reported in his journal that the Tiradim simply refused to play the measure game. They tried other ways of combating Perron. Many of them simply withdrew from the trial. So what's to be explained, and further analysis I think is required here, even though the literature is large, is how those numbers already fitted in to a pattern of discrimination that was always already in power. We can tell more briefly exactly the same story about the Egyptian expedition, where under the leadership of the French engineer Pierre Simon Girard, French hydraulic architects were dispatched by Bonaparte's army up the Nile Valley. They linked together their measures of Egyptian hydraulic installations, as you see top left, with Gerard's measure of the nilometer, with their own experiences as canal builders in the outskirts of Paris. What they encountered in the Nile Valley was in fact a highly complex, deeply sophisticated system of irrigation and cultivation, which had recently modernized, which involved the production of huge agricultural surpluses in grain, and which Girard and his French colleagues found incomprehensible. It wasn't legible to the French, that's the key point. This artisan communal ecology was incomprehensible to the French equipped with precision measures. Instead, rather like Baudin, Perron and Desgerando, what the French thought they were encountering was a decadent, corrupt, hopeless, qualitative, inefficient agricultural system that had decayed from a millennia old pharaonic system of expert engineering which spookily resembled the Ecole des Points Chaussée. So the pharaohs had allegedly established engineering colleges, organized Nile irrigation. That system had been abandoned and decayed under the Turks and the Mamluks in Islam. And now what the French were gonna do was to restore Nile agronomy to its pharaonic enlightenment by applying measures. And the device to which they applied these measures was this one. Just in, indulge me for a moment. See, I, so I just want people to see this. This is a film made by the British Army in 1947. 
to show that Egypt is still dependent on the Nile. And what you're seeing is a device called the Shaduf, which is a device, as you see, for raising water from the river to the fields. And you see the same device in Girard in the description of Egypt, and you see the same device in Navier's hydraulic architecture of 1819. So that device becomes a textbook example of measurement. What the French engineers did was to measure the efficiency of the fellahin whom you've just seen, or their ancestors, I should say, of the fellahin, and to demonstrate that the fellahin plus a shadouf are less efficient to a factor of 10 in comparison with the workmen building the Canal de Lourdes and the Canal Saint-Denis. What really distinguishes Nile agriculture from enlightenment is efficiency, measurement. So let me finish with, sorry, not him, him, with Joseph Fourier, founder of precision physics. But of course, Fourier was also secretary of the French Institute in Cairo. And it was Fourier in his great preface to the description of Egypt, who insists the most on the role that precision measurement plays in defining European enlightenment and discriminating against all other cultures. The new system of irrigation, Fourier argued, would be founded on precise measures. Egypt would become France. So what I've tried to set out in the talk is some sketches of the ways in which, on the one hand, the discourse on precision measurement has produced an extraordinarily complex and in many ways rebarbative historiography for us, while at the same time it played absolutely decisive roles, not only in the establishment of certain models of the laboratory and of the physical sciences and well beyond, but also in this remarkable set of politico-scientific attempts, highly undiplomatic, if Sam will allow me to say that, to discriminate between the regimes of quantity and quality between self and other. We need to move on. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very rich and stimulating talk. I'm afraid we don't have time for questions. Uh, I will disappoint you. But Erwin is here, I'm glad to say. And he, I will ask him to come to join us and award the medal to Simon. Um, Costas was supposed to be here too, but he had, ah, there he is, okay. So Costas, okay. Costas, please join us too. Let me say that the Gustav Neuenswander Prize is due to the generosity of Erwin Neuenswander. So, so we are really pleased to have you here. So it's a great pleasure uh, to give a medals to these two important scientists. And I'm very proud uh, that I can help to do something for history of science with a prize. And I also hope that the prize will continue for many years and perhaps also after my death. So for that reason, I have made the Gustav Neuenschwander Foundation, which has now about uh, 1 million of euros and they will have much more later on. So I don't want to speak too much that time. I just would like to present the medals to Simon. And I thank him very much that he came here. Thank you. And he gave us such a marvelous, inspiring talk. Thanks very much. Again, and 
we were very sorry because of the pandemic, we couldn't give a prize two years ago. So here is the next. 